So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Anthony Staples. I'm one of the pediatric neurologists and pediatric sleep specialists here at Carillion. Thank you for joining today. Uh, this is a rather vaguely titled talk um, because it's a sister talk of uh, another talk I give called Normal Pediatric Sleep. Um, and things are not progressing. I don't have any pertinent financial disclosures or conflicts of interest related to this talk. I, I will reference a book that I did not write, nor do I get any financial benefit from, but I think it's a good book. Uh, our objectives for today are to identify and describe common causes of sleep difficulties in pediatric patients, review the recommended and first-line treatment for these common etiologies of sleep difficulties, and identify potential common pitfalls in the treatment of these conditions. Uh, we're going to be talking about four ICD-10 diagnoses today, but realistically we're talking about two major categories of, of issues, and these are things that anybody that practices pediatric medicine will see at least weekly, if not daily, for many of you who are in primary care. And we're gonna do a couple cases. I would love to have some audience participation. I can't see the chat, so I don't know. Throw stuff in there anyways. Um, so the first case is 10 month old female presenting with her parents for parental concerns about her difficulties falling asleep and staying asleep. She has the same routine every night. Starting at 7 p.m., she takes a bath and then her mom or dad, they take turns, will read books while rocking her in her rocking chair. They have to rock her until she falls asleep because if they don't, she will cry immediately upon being put down in the crib. It takes 30 to 40 minutes of rocking for her to fall asleep initially. After she falls asleep, she sleeps great in her crib without any snoring or restlessness for one or two hours. But then she wakes up crying, requiring her parents to rock her back to sleep again. It takes five to 15 minutes of rocking her to go back to sleep. And that cycle just repeats multiple times throughout the night every night. She's never slept through the night and isn't getting any better over time. Her parents aren't sure they can take much more of this. And I think, think everybody who is a parent, um, let's see if I can make a laser pointer here, understands this picture here um, when you have a little baby. So <clears throat> what is the primary cause or diagnosis in these sleep issues? Maybe I can try to alt tab over to the Microsoft team. Anybody? So that we don't get too far behind, I'm gonna keep moving in a second here, but. So the correct answer is A, behavioral insomnia childhood sleep onset association subtype, which, um, and it's not progressing again, come on, which is a subtype of chronic insomnia now in the ICSD-3, which is the uh, International Classification of Sleep, sleep Disorders. They kind of got rid of all the other types and lumped them under chronic insomnia, but it's still beneficial to understand the differences. While we're here, we're going to talk more about behavioral insomnia of childhood soon, so I'll skip that one. Psychophysiological insomnia is the patient who comes to you and says, I just can't sleep in my bed, I feel more awake, I can't get to sleep, and then you ask them, how do you sleep when you go on a trip or when you're camping or when you're in a hotel? Oh, I sleep great. They've kind of learned negative associations with their bed, and that's why they can't sleep, and that's a whole other bag of worms. And then paradoxical insomnia is very interesting. That's a patient that comes to you and says, Doc, I've only slept two hours in it every night for the, for the last five years. I feel fine during the day, but I just don't get any sleep. And of course, you think to yourself, that's not true. That can't be true. Um, and then you do a polysomnogram on them, and they sleep eight nights, eight hours great. And then you ask them, how did you sleep last night? And they say, two hours is always, Doc. And you explain to them, no, they slept eight hours. And sometimes that goes well, and sometimes that doesn't. But anyways, let's get back to the task at hand. So bedtime problems are very common in children. I think these numbers are low, but 20, the numbers that I've read are 20 or 30% of children less than three have sleep problems. Um, and these can lead to emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and academic problems for children and sleep and daytime function problems for their parents. And then 25 to 50% of children have frequent nighttime awakenings. Parental presence at the sleep onset is one of the most common predictors of frequent nighttime awakenings with signaling. Signaling meaning requiring the parental help after that point. And awakenings are normal, but signaling or requiring parental intervention is not. So behavioral insomnia of childhood, behavioral insomnia of childhood has three subtypes: sleep onset association, limit setting, and a combined type. The ability to sleep through the night develops somewhere between three and six months. You really shouldn't be diagnosing somebody with insomnia, and specifically behavioral insomnia of childhood, prior to six months. And even at six months, um, it's kind of difficult. So the sleep onset association type, this is where they have a process of falling asleep that is extended and requiring special conditions. The sleep onset associations are problematic or demanding. We all have sleep onset associations. For most of us, it's our pillow or blanket or bed. That's fine. You can fall asleep again on your own with your pillow or blanket in your bed. 
For babies, if they're rocked to sleep, if they're fed to sleep, nursed to sleep, that's what they're used to. That's their association. And if they don't have that, they can't get to sleep. And if they wake up, they can't get back to sleep. And that's where it becomes a problematic or demanding association. In the absence of the association, sleep on the set is delayed, is disrupted. Nighttime awakenings require caregiver intervention. They have a lack of self-soothing. And this is frequently an issue in younger infants and toddlers. The limit setting type is difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep by stalling or refusal to go to bed or return to bed after nighttime awakenings. So this is the child with the curtain calls. They say, one more book. How about one more hug? I need a snack. I want to drink something. Um, and they just keep, they, they'll come up with things until you stop them for hours. Um, this is not necessarily a problem with the child. The child's job is to test the boundaries, to test what they can do. This is more a lack of parental understanding of what's happening with insufficient or inappropriate caregiver limit setting. Often more of a sleep initiation problem, but it can be a middle of the night problem too, coming to the room of the parents, um, asking multiple requests. This is less of a baby problem and more of a toddler and young child problem. And the treatment of these two conditions are, is purely behavioral. Um, and I, I joke that it's consistent consistency that is consistently consistent. So it's very important that every caregiver is on board with the treatment and ready to do it and understands what their role is and they all agree on what they're gonna do. Maybe some people are gonna be easier, some people are gonna be harder on the kid, but they all have to be in agreement. Um, if one person's gonna be very strict with limit setting and the next person the next night's gonna let them do whatever they want to, they're never gonna get better. Involve sleep training putting down children sleepy, but not asleep, which is something we recommend starting around three to four months of age, so that they can learn to put themselves to sleep for the sleep onset associations. Or for the limit setting, just having a cutoff, saying, yeah, after one sip of water, if they have another request, they know it's, it's bedtime, and sticking with that. Um, sleep hygiene is important. Uh, having a consistent bedtime routine helps a child understand and start working towards bed in their mind. I, I, I am by no means an exemplary parent. I try my best as we all do. Um, and being a sleep doctor doesn't help at all with my kids getting to sleep. But I give the example of my son. He knows the second we cut off his light after we've done our routine, which is not long, it's 10 or 15 minutes, he snuggles his head into your chest and he starts yawning immediately. And that's because his brain has learned the steps and it, he's starting to set himself up for sleep as he goes along. A consistent schedule is important. Kids should not be staying up three or four hours later on the weekends and sleeping on the weekends. Babies, toddlers, and I would say all pediatric patients should have a fairly consistent sleep schedule. Put them down sleepy but not asleep, like we said, so they can develop self-soothing. There are various other techniques. Extinction is probably the most hardcore, um, and that's just where you put them in the bed and you ignore them until it's time to wake up. You're obviously ensuring their safety from a distance, but that is just purely ignore them for the rest of the night. Note that anytime you try any type of extinction, that or graduate extinction, there will be an extinction burst, meaning there will be a worsening of the sleep at first because you're trying to change a habit. Uh, habits aren't easy to change. It's like when you try to quit sugar for a month, that first week is not great. Um, many people are more able to do graduated extinction, which is where you kind of put the child down, let them cry it out for a specific period of time, go in and check on them, comfort them, but also not too loving because um, what children want in that moment is attention and when you give them attention that kind of helps makes them cry longer the next time so really you shouldn't go in yelling because negative attention is attention you don't go in angry you also don't go in and cuddle them pick them up and rock them to sleep now no you go in and say it's okay it's bedtime good night so that they know you're still there and you leave again for a specified period of time for the children of limit setting type a bedtime pass can be very effective, more effective at around three to six years of age. Um, that's where you get a little laminated card, right? And that laminated card is good to walk to mom or dad and say, hey, I need something. But then they hand that card to you. And after that, their requests are meaningless to you. Again, of course, outside of safety. Uh, you can add rewards to that. Like if you keep your card, meaning you don't ask for anything in the middle of the night, and you keep your card until the next morning, you get a little star on a chart, and after you get a certain number of stars, you can get a toy or a special, special meal, or the thing that's free other than time, and children find the most, been, most tempting, is special time with a parent, going to a park or doing something like that. 
That last part can be a little tricky because if you have one good sleeper and one bad sleeper, if you start rewarding the bad sleeper for sleeping well, you're probably going to have to reward the good sleeper for sleeping well as well. And positive reinforcement. So rewarding and praising um, good behavior is very important. This is the book I was referencing earlier that I have no relationship with. This is written by Jody Mandel. She is out of uh, CHOP. She's a sleep psychologist. And it's a great book, I think, for anybody who is seeing pediatric patients. Um, it's a good book. And then for anybody whose patients are having trouble with sleep, it's a good book as well. And it's really meant for those babies and toddler years. Um, she also has a book called Take Charge of Your Child's Sleep, which is more the uh, school-age child book. This next case is a little long-winded. I might skip around a little bit, but this is a different thing. And another thing you'll see very commonly. So this is a 16-year-old male presenting for difficulty falling asleep. For the last two or three years, most nights a week, it takes him hours to fall asleep. This is causing him to have trouble in school, especially in his morning classes, where he feels like he has no energy and has to fight hard to stay awake, often nodding off in his morning classes. His parents bring him in now because he is learning to drive, and they are wary that he may not be safe to drive to school in the morning as he often falls asleep on the way to school. They are also tired of fighting with him to get him out of the bed for school. On weeknights, he gets in bed about 9 p.m. so he can get enough sleep before he has to wake up at 6 a.m. the following morning for school. So he's thinking about it, right? He's trying to get himself nine hours of sleep. But it's a struggle for him to get ready for bed by 9 p.m. By the time he finishes basketball practice and games, does his homework, eats dinner, it's already 8 p.m. if not later, he's still hyped up and he's nowhere close to ready to go to bed. Um, he ends up unwinding, watching some TV with his parents, and then at about 8.30, he'll brush his teeth, get changed, and work toward bed. He doesn't feel tired at all when he lies down and often feels the most awake he's felt all day when he's getting into bed. His parents don't allow electronics in the room or at night. Good for them. Please, uh, no electronics in the bed ever. 24-7, 365, except for that fourth year, then 366. Um, he stays in bed in the dark room, tossing and turning, often for two to three hours, sometimes longer, and finally falls asleep around midnight or 1 a.m. After falling asleep, he sleeps well until 6 a.m. when his parents come to wake him. Despite their best efforts, it usually takes 20 minutes or more for him to get out of bed due to significant sleep inertia. They just can't get him out of that bed. When he finally gets up, he feels tired throughout the day and has difficulty concentrating. But on the weekends, he stays up late playing video games, watching TV, or out with his friends until midnight or later. He usually gets in bed around 1 a.m. on the weekends, and he falls asleep very quickly. He sleeps well after falling asleep unless his parents intervene. He will not sleep until 11 a.m. the next day, so about 10 hours, waking up and coming down just in time for lunch. On most weekend days, he feels great with plenty of energy for the day. This always comes crashing down on Sunday night when he gets in bed at 9 p.m. in preparation for school. So... Uh, by the CDC and the National Sleep Foundation, teens should be having about an hour, average of nine hours of sleep a night, uh, eight to 10. I always tell them nine. I think of uh, sleep as a little bit like alcoholism. If somebody says they drink one drink a day, that you're, in your mind, they drink three drinks a day. If a teen says they sleep eight hours a day, in your mind, round that down a little bit. Um, so I always say at least nine hours in hopes that they'll at least hit that eight. So what is the primary cause or diagnosis? sleep issues. Again, I'm just going to give us a few seconds if anybody wants to chime in. You're welcome to speak up too. Sleep. Delayed sleep waste disorder. I agree. Very good. And now let me see if I can get back to the right screen. Um, so why is it not insomnia? Uh, so sleeps great when he sleeps when he wants to, which is later and sleeps in later. He gets to bed when he wants to get to bed. He falls asleep almost instantly, sleeps great through the night, wakes up the next day, feels refreshed. Um, people with insomnia, if they stay up later, they will build up more sleep drive. So they often do fall asleep a little bit easier, but they still have trouble. Um, why is it not inadequate sleep hygiene? He very clearly has inadequate sleep hygiene. He's up watching TV right before bed. He, on the weekends, he's staying up late playing video games with his friends. But despite that, he's still falling asleep just fine when he's sleeping when he wants to. And then, um, of course, for those who have to do boards again anytime soon, undisclosed substance abuse is just nonsense. It's never the answer of something we didn't discuss at all. Um, so delayed sleep-wake phase disorder. This is a little picture of the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, sort of like the DSM of sleep disorders. Uh, the diagnostic criteria is significant delay in the phase of the major sleep episode with inability to fall asleep or difficulty awakening at the desired time. The symptoms must be present for at least three months, and when they're allowed to sleep ad lib, 
have improved sleep quality and duration with the laid phase. They, <laughs> so technically, to diagnose this, you are supposed to have a sleep log and if possible, possible activity for seven days, prefer 14 days, including work, school days, and free days. I'm gonna, that is, that is the technical rule. Uh, I have given out many sleep logs and I can count on one hand the number of sleep logs I've returned. So I would be unable to diagnose anybody with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder if I followed that rule. Um, and then actigraphy, unfortunately, is not compensated for by insurance and is a very expensive little machine. Uh, we don't have a ton of them running around because they're expensive and you get no, no payment for them. Uh, so doing that on a regular basis is not realistic. But in an ideal world, you do that. Of course, it's not better explained by another disorder. So it, people with delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, they have some delay. Some delay is normal in adolescence. They normally want to stay up later, wake up later. It becomes a disorder when it causes distress or impaired functioning. I have no memory of what our patient's name was. I think it was John. But in John, he was sleepy during the day. He was having trouble concentrating. He was falling asleep, especially in his morning classes, which is when he'd normally still be asleep if he had his choice. In these patients, their sleep is normal. The only thing that's abnormal, and that's heavy air quotes, it's a timing. And that timing isn't technically abnormal either. That's a societal thing, right? We've decided what time school starts, what time school ends, what time work starts. Um, yeah. So delayed sleep like phase disorder is more common in adolescents and young adults, about 7 to 16%. And that's a disorder, not just delayed sleep, right? Almost all adolescents have some delayed phase, but not a disorder. It's only present in about 0.15% of working adults. It's seen in 10% of patients with recurrent insomnia complaints. And so really, whenever I have somebody come in with insomnia, I really try to drill down, how do you sleep on the weekends? What time do you go to bed? How long does it take for you to fall asleep on the weekends when you go to bed? Do you sleep fine through the night after that? Do you feel fine that next day? Because that can really help you understand, is this just a delayed phase and they're trying their best on, during the week, but they're not doing a good job? Um, or are they actually having insomnia? And then the family history tends to be present in about 40% of patients. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, we have enough. I'm going to get in the weeds of this slide a little bit in the next slide. Uh, so this slide, the gray portion, I hope you guys can see my little red pointer, is when the person's asleep. The white portion is when they're awake. The blue up arrow is something called the DLMO, dim light melatonin onset. Uh, so in the presence of dim light, in the absence of blue light, that is when melatonin starts being produced, going up to help us fall asleep. That should happen one to two hours before you go to sleep at your habitual sleep time. And that's why I always tell folks no screens for at least two hours before bedtime, because if their DMO happens to be two hours before they should be going to sleep and their face is buried in TikTok at that time, then they're not going to be getting the melatonin onset. We're gonna look from the morning here up through the end of this day. So the, I don't know, teal, bluish, whatever that is, is something called process S. Process S is driven by adenosine. So adenosine triphosphate and other substances, but adenosine seems to be one of the biggest ones. Adenosine triphosphate breaks down and you have adenosine left behind. As you use energy throughout the day, you build up process S and that gives you a sleep pressure. As you move up on the y-axis, you're having increased desire to sleep. But when you fall asleep, that process S burns off very quickly. And that's why we uh, advise against evening naps, because now you've burned off your process S really quickly, and then you're trying to get back to sleep, but it's just slowly building back up. And that's actually the function of caffeine. Caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. So that's how caffeine helps us feel better. Uh, and that's why sometimes when the caffeine runs out, you crash. The adenosine didn't go away. You just didn't realize it was there. This is process C, or the circadian rhythm. So right before the DLMO, the desire to sleep based on circadian rhythm is the lowest. That's that second wind phenomenon. You know, 8 p.m. rolls around, you felt like you, you were going to die the entire day, and then you try to lie down a little early because you're so sleepy and you are the most awake you've ever been. Uh, and then as you progress through the night, after the process S has worn off, the process C is what helps you stay asleep. So teenagers... The process C is shifted to the right. It's delayed. And then the process S, uh, you know, they're caffeinated. It may not be as built up or they might not be able to recognize the build up. To back up on caffeine real quick, since I don't have a slide on this, 
the half-life of caffeine in the healthy young adult is five hours. Uh, the half-life in an elderly person can be as much as nine hours. That's why uh, many people as they age find that a little bit of caffeine is even at noon is too much for them. I have so many patients that come to me that will drink a venti coffee from Starbucks at 9 p.m., go to bed at 11 p.m. and wonder why they can't sleep. And hopefully that is immediately apparent to all of you, but if not, uh, with the half-life of caffeine being five hours, that means a quarter of it's still there 10 hours later. So I generally recommend no caffeine after lunchtime. And if I try to specify actually noon, because who knows what time lunch is. And then also uh, teenagers have a uh, DLMO that's later because their circadian rhythm is, is pressed to the right. So delayed sleep like phase disorder has increased rates of mood disorders and dis depression, suicidality, decreased health related quality of life, decreased sleep duration when not allowed to sleep at their preferred time with increased daytime sleepiness and more sleep complaints. It, the list goes on and on, but impaired academic functioning and poor school attendance. These people miss the first few um, classes a lot of times because they sleep in um, and they're hard to get up and increased likelihood of substance abuse. There is a subtype called motivated delayed sleep wake phase disorder. It sounds like a good thing. Oh, they're motivated. It's not good. Um, these are people who are motivated to be delayed. These are people with anxiety, depression, or school, school avoidance, ADHD, um, learning disability, and they, they don't want to go to school. They don't want to be awake when other people are awake. They don't want to be around other people. And so they intentionally delay themselves. They intentionally want to be delayed, and they will not get better. Since the treatment for this is largely behavioral with some chronobiotic uh, trickery as well, which we'll get to in a few moments, uh, these patients do not get better. And this kind of comes down to the patients who, again, go back to alcohol or smoking, you always should ask, hey, are you ready to change? Are you ready to make a change? Because I think that's important for you and explain why it is important for them. But if they say no, it's not necessarily worth your time or theirs to just keep on hammering that in, right? It's say, hey, well, talk to me when you are because I'm ready to help you for that. Um, these people often have exaggerated presenting symptoms, meaning this is the person who's going to bed at 7 a.m. and waking up at, at 5 p.m. Like they... It couldn't be more obvious they're trying to avoid everybody and they, they don't comply with treatment. So how do we treat delayed sleep wake phase disorder? So light therapy, light in the morning, which gets tricky and that's what we're gonna go over. That's one of the pitfalls we talked about. Melatonin, specifically low dose melatonin. Uh, generally start with one milligram. If that's effective, you actually go down from that. Or if it's ineffective, you can go up slowly, but not high doses. We're looking for a chronobiotic response, not a sedating response. Uh, this is kind of meant to, self in, to help induce their own DLMO earlier. And it's most effective four to six hours prior to the DLMO. When we talk about the DLMO, it's one to two hours before sleep onset. So we're talking about five to seven hours before typical sleep onset is when this is most effective. So we're talking about dinner time or earlier melatonin. Sleep hygiene uh, is necessary but not sufficient meaning it's absolutely necessary, you have to do it, but that alone is unlikely to resolve this. A consistent bed and wake time is very important. It's specifically the wake time. You don't want them to be lying in bed awake at night on the weekdays uh, because that's a good way to get a negative association with their bed when they get frustrated. So instead you really focus on, you need to be waking up around the same time every day, no more than one hour variance. None of this waking up at noon on a Saturday and Sunday. If you have to be up at 6.30, on school days and you have to be up at 7.30 at the latest on the weekend. A consistent bedtime routine that is free of screens, no napping, especially at night, especially at night. Um, and then avoid caffeine and avoid screens or lights in the evening and in bed. Uh, the reason I say in bed, there's something called stimulus control, which is part of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is another 45 minute talk. So we're not gonna do that today. Um, but Whenever you do something else in the bed, you learn to associate that thing with the bed or the bed with that thing. So the only thing you should ever do in bed is sleep. If you do screens or homework or anything else in the bed at any given time, your brain gets confused when it's bedtime as to what you're trying to do. Chronotherapy is something that we sometimes do when a kid comes school starting in two weeks and they are sleeping from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then instead of trying to advance them, move their sleep backwards to where you want it, you actually intentionally delay them further because they already are somebody who naturally delays. So you're kind of working with their circadian rhythm and delaying them further until they get to the right time and then you try to anchor them. Got to be careful with that. You run the risk of flipping them into a non 24 hour sleep wake disorder where they just keep on moving around the clock after that. But that's something that's described. 
And I'm seeing when I have five minutes, and this is one of the more complicated slides, so we're going to try to talk quickly. So circadian midpoint is the core body temperature nadir. This is the response to light based on when you give it in comparison to the core body temperature nadir. So it, negative numbers means if you give light to somebody at that time, so this is the circadian midpoint. The negative numbers mean if you give them light therapy at that time, that further delays them. That makes them want to stay up later and wake up later. Whereas the positive numbers means if you give them light at that time, that advances them, makes them want to go to sleep earlier and wake up earlier. We're trying to advance these patients because they are delayed. So when is the circadian midpoint? You can measure that in a lab if you wanted to. Good luck with that. Uh, more realistically, it's about two to three hours before their habitual wake up time. Not there, I have to get up for school time, their weekend vacation wake up time when nobody's waking them up. And so you can see in John's case how that could be dangerous, right? So John's habitual wake up time was 11 a.m. So we'll say, what, uh, 8 to 9 a.m.? I'm doing math live on a talk, that's a bad idea. 8 to 9 a.m. is his core body temperature nadir. He has to wake up, I forget, 6.30 for school. So somebody well-meaning would say, hey, get a bright light and sit in front of it while you're eating breakfast at 6.30. You've just given him light before his core body temperature nadir. You are delaying him further. In fact, when I see these patients, I tell them, wear sunglasses on the way to school. I give you a letter so you can wear sunglasses while you're in school until after your core body temperature nadir. And then get light exposure after that time. So he needs to get light at 9, not at 6.30. One of the big things I want to take away from this. Um, so you'll see here, again, if you, A is melatonin given before the DLMO and before the core body temperature nadir, that helps advance people. B is melatonin given at about eight to 10 hours after the DLMO or after the core body temperature nadir, that actually further delays you. And then light is the exact opposite. If you give light before the core body temperature nadir, it delays you, and if you give it after, it advances you. It helps you get back to where you should be. Again, I would love some input on this if anybody's feeling up to it. So this is a patient at 9 p.m., lies in bed for four hours, awake on his phone, finally falls asleep around 1 a.m., wakes up at 6.30, feeling tired. On weekends, he gets to bed at 12.45, falls asleep by 1 a.m., wakes up at 11 a.m., feeling refreshed. I think I may have, I, I did talk about that. Um, so. What dose of melatonin and what time would you give him melatonin? If anybody wants to. If not, I will answer. <laughs> okay, so less than one milligram or about one milligram. And we said four to six hours before his DLMO. His DLMO would be one to two hours before 1 a.m. So we're looking at about 11 to 12 p.m. So we'll say about five hours before 12 p.m. So, oh gosh, I'm doing that math again. 7 p.m., uh, one milligram of melatonin. And what you do is you slowly work that backwards. So you give him one milligram of melatonin at 7 p.m. for three days. And then when he's falling asleep better at the more appropriate time, you work it back a little bit, 20, 30 minutes for a few days. And you work it back a little bit. What time would you recommend light therapy? Definitely not at 6.30 when he wakes up. That's before his core body temperature nadir. Two to three hours before his 11 a.m. wake up would put him at nine, 8 to 9 a.m. for his core body temperature nadir. So at 9 a.m. is when he needs light therapy. And again, you're slowly working that back by 30 minutes at a time or an hour. It depends on how bad the patient is at, at waking up when they need to be. And what other things would you recommend for this patient? You know, consistency for sleep, wake, all those other things we talked about, which I have less than one minute, so we won't go through all of that. School start times, later is better. Nine to one cost benefit ratio for later start times. Um, I don't know how the folks who came up with this came up with this, because I feel like there's too many variables to understand. Parents' work starts at a certain time. It's so many different things, but at least for the kids, we know for sure that later school start times are better. Uh, and then most schools haven't figured that out yet. And these are my references. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Sorry, those last couple of slides are a bit quick, and I'm sorry that the uh, physiology stuff was a bit quick as well. So if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to try to answer. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope I didn't put you all to sleep with my sleep talk after you ate. <laughs>